All right, you guys are opening up to Mark chapter 6. We're going to finish chapter 6 this morning. And, um, you know, here's the, the, the thing, okay? Uh, we're talking about power dynamics. You know, when somebody has power, when someone is given power or authority, it is used for something. It is used to accomplish a task. Uh, Ross, I need you back in here because I'm going to forget these guys' names. But, like, think about, okay, think about um, the man managers, new managers. Stay here. I'm going to need you for a second because I forget these guys' names. But, uh, uh, you know, managers come in and a new manager, some guys use, or ladies, men, whatever, use their power, authority, new job, and they, like, buy pizza and they do things and they use it because they want to be chums with everybody, right? Other managers come in and they're like, no, this is going to be how it is. Like, okay, so you think about The Office. What's the one, uh, who was Will Ferrell's character in The Office? D'Angelo Vickers. D'Angelo Vickers. <laughs> and he comes in, and he's buying pizza, and he's doing all of these things, trying to get people to like him. And he's not, like, he's trying to be the buddy-buddy, okay? But then who's the other guy that comes in? The soccer player who, like, anybody remember? Charles. Charles comes in, and he is, he's this guy who's, running everything by the rules he's never gonna bend he's never gonna break there's no nonsense and both of these guys are trying to recreate the office into their own identity they are using the power that they have to create what they want to create right we see this we get this teachers do it you know Bosses do it, family members do it. You know, we, we have these positions of authority and we use them to establish what we want the things to be. Well, Jesus came with power and authority. Jesus came with power and authority and, and it's very important for us to watch and see how he uses it because it tells us a lot. And when we look at this section of Mark chapter 6, we see that he uses his power and authority to care for us and convince us that he is the son of God. He uses his, his power and authority to care for us and convince us that he is the son of God and that our response should be in the response of the disciples and those who are following him to turn and believe to turn and to trust. This morning, my big idea is that we need to live like people who believe in the power of Jesus. We need to live like people who believe in the power of Jesus. When we take time and we see how he uses his power to care, how he uses his power to convince, to show us who he is, it should then cause us to turn and believe and then live like people who believe that. And live like people that we believe in, in that somebody walked out of the grave, who defeated death. We need to live like people who believe in the power of Jesus. So this morning, I have two points. Two points. Isn't that great? Like, we're going to be here for like 75 minutes. It's, it's awesome, okay? We had two points. Uh, the first one is that Jesus uses his power to care and convince. I want to pick up halfway through, you know, Mark chapter 6. And remember, you know, last week we looked at this idea of uh, just... Jesus and, and sending out his disciples and just how we can learn from him and seeing both success and failure and seeing, you know, his fail, not his failure, but it being rejected in Nazareth and then the success of his disciples when he sent them out. But at the same time, we saw the death of John the Baptist. And, you know, and so we just seeing kind of the ups and downs of ministry as Jesus is uh, multiplying his ministry through his disciples now jesus then brings them back and now they get into a boat and they were going out to find rest okay and jesus is caring for his disciples and wanting them to find rest but at the same time something else is happening and we're going to pick up in verse 30 i'm really going to only go from 32 but i'm going to pick up verse 30 just because it's a little bit easier there it says this for the apostles had returned to jesus and told him uh, all that they had done and taught, and they said to him, come away by yourself to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to even eat. Talking about the disciples. And they went away uh, in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran on foot from the towns 
and got there ahead of them. And they went ashore. He saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this, or came to his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countrysides and villages and buy them something to eat. But he said, but he answered, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, so we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when he, they had found out, they said five and two fish. And then he, or then he commanded them <clears throat> to go and sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups by the hundreds and by the fifties. And taking the loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples uh, to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them and they sat and were satisfied and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets of broken pieces of fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So we're going to keep going. I'm going to get some water because my throat is like dying. But, um, you know, so here again, we're picking right back up after this sound great. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> All right, so, you know, Jesus picks up, or this picks up right after Jesus had just sent them out. I mean, they've been traveling with Jesus. They've been seeing all of his uh, miracles and the things that he's doing. He's preaching authoritatively, and then he's having the miracles to back those things up. They're, they're watching this, and then Jesus multiplies his ministry, and he sends his disciples out. He gives them authority. They're casting out demons. They're preaching with authority. They're healing people. They're doing all this. And then they come back, and then there's these stories. And there's two things that we want to see, both what Jesus is doing and then the response of the disciples. And we can learn a lot from ourselves. And what Jesus is doing is he is using his power to care and to convince Okay, he's using his power to do the two things that, that God has called them to do. And, you know, so they come back and they're, they're wanting to find a place of rest and they're wanting to, you know, recoup a little bit, which is a good thing. But they go to this and now the, the Sea of Galilee is really small. You can go, I looked it up on, you can look it up on Google Maps even now. And it's really small. And you can actually see from one side to the other side. And so when, when they go into the boat, you know, it's, it wouldn't be hard for these people to run around to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and they start to get in the boat. They're going to the other side. The people follow. Okay, they're hearing all of the things that Jesus is doing, and they want more. Now, again, the crowds don't fully understand yet. We know that, okay? But, but at least they understand something that, that Jesus is giving them something that they want. So they come around, and when they get to the other side, they get out of the boat, and Jesus immediately has compassion. Okay, um, when I get done on Sunday mornings, I'm exhausted. Okay. I go home and I, a lot of times I lay down on my couch and I take a nap. I want to go rest, especially if the Packer game is at, at three o'clock, like it is today or three 30. I'm going to try to rest. The Packers are going to win. Got it. Got it. Yeah. But you know, I'm going to go home and try to get a nap in before that. If you come to me while I'm resting, I am not going to answer my phone and I'm going to tell you to go away. Okay, I love you. I'm getting up early. I'm meeting with you right now. We're doing our thing. Church is great. I'm super excited what the Lord is doing. But when I have my rest time, I'm an ordinary person. Now, and I'm not saying that my orneriness is right or my response is correct. It could be sinful, okay? I'm not using it as an example. What I am saying is that I'm ordinary. But Jesus had compassion. When the crowd showed up, he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. You know, last week we talked about the fact that Jesus cared greatly for the disciples. Some of his greatest ministry was to the 12. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that he forgot the crowds. And he loved them and he had compassion on them. And he preached. And if you go and you look at the, um, the, in both Luke and Matthew at the same account, he also cast out demons and he healed. He cared for these people. He used his power to preach. He used his power to care and to love because these people were like a crowd without a shepherd. 
But then it was getting late. You could just imagine the disciples were tired. They're exhausted. They'd just gone out. They were supposed to get a break. They are supposed to have a weekend away, and they didn't get it. And so they're ornery. Like, you know, we get it, right? We understand that. They're, they're ornery. And so they go back to Jesus. Like, okay, just think about this, okay? This is 5,000 men. That doesn't include women. That doesn't include children. There's probably closer to ten to 15,000 people there on the low end. Okay, but think about that. Uh, how, how many? How many does Pfizer form hold? Nineteen thousand. What is it? Eighteen five. So like, like this is probably getting close. If we're if we're honest, and we're thinking about how the size of families and things like that, that this is probably getting to the size of a packed out Pfizer form. Okay, like it's a big crowd. This is not just a small thing. It's five thousand men plus the women plus all the kids. It's, it's a big crowd. And, and so the disciples are there. Jesus is ministering. He's pre- I don't know how he preached to that many people without amplification. My voice would be done. But, um, you know, he's preaching them. He's healing them. And then he's getting, if they don't have fast food restaurants. Then you can't call in. You can't do delivery. They don't have pizza. Like, like food is scarce. They don't do this like we did. They have to, like, build a fire and make a stone and grind things and do, like, all of these things to, and so the disciples are like, Jesus, we got to let these people go because we're not going to feed them. Like, this is going to take forever. And uh, <laughs> what does Jesus say? What does he say? Look at it. Tell me. You. What does he say? You give them something to eat. You feed them. Can you imagine the disciples? <sighs> Like, and, and that's exactly what happens. He tells them, you feed them. And immediately, instead of thinking about all the ways that they have seen God working and all the power and all the ways that God has given them the power, they go to logistics. Uh, Jesus, if you start to do the math, and I take out my calendar here, or my calculator here, and I start to, it would take, like, literally, what does it say? 200 denarii. That's like eight months worth of work. Okay? This would take, like, Eight months worth of pay to feed these people. We don't have that. You can, can you see Jesus chuckling a little bit to himself? You know, they always show Jesus like a super stoked. I bet he's chuckling in this moment. I think he is. Just kind of laughing to himself, knowing what's coming. But what he's doing is he's saying, you know, the power that has been on display for the disciples and the power that he's handed over to the disciples, it's meant to change them to cause them to trust, and he's challenging them. Hey, look at all the things that I've done, you know, and and I've done now through you. You give them something to eat, but instead of being changed, they responded like they always would have. More on that later. But instead, they start to complain. We we don't have that much. We can't do that. And so Jesus says, well, go find out. Go find out what we do have. And what is it? How much is there? I'm like, you got to stop answering these questions. Let people answer. <laughs> Thank you. Five loaves and two fish. Five loaves and two fish. That's not a lot of food. That doesn't even feed Micah. Okay, like, you know, I got four kids or four boys. Jaden could feed off of that. But, you know, that's not going to feed very many people. And that's intentional. Jesus is including numbers because he wants to see. Well, go find this for us. What is it? Five loaves and two fish. Again, I mean, this is total Wisconsin. Then he commanded them all to sit down. And and here's the thing, okay? The disciples don't do everything, but they do listen. There's some faith. And so there's a conflict here. The disciples are learning. The crowds are trying to understand. They're in kind of, this is kind of this in-between stage. And so, yes, I'm dogging on the the disciples. Don't worry, I'm going to get tough. I'm going to dog on us soon in a few minutes here. Uh, But there is some obedience. There's a, there's a transformation taking place to the point where they do listen. And he has them go find these things. They bring it to Jesus. And then he commands them to sit down and he sits them down. And, and then he, he takes them and they, they organize all the people. And, and then they take the, Jesus takes the two loaves or the five loaves and the two fish. And he looks up to heaven and he starts to pray. He doesn't need to do this. Okay? He's already in communion with the Lord, but he does this for the disciples and for the, the crowds. And he prays and he blesses it. And you know what? You know who actually ends up feeding the people? The disciples. 
They actually do. He goes up and he starts handing this out to the disciples and they start taking it to the people. They start feeding the people. And I have no idea how this worked out. Okay. Did he break it off and did it grow back? Uh, you know, was this like CGI? Like, did he take one fish and then all of a sudden another fish popped back? In the, I, I, you can do whatever you want. You can figure that one out. We don't know. All we know is that he blessed this fish. He gave, and then he started breaking it and the disciples took it. And when he divided it among them, it kept dividing. It kept going to the point. What does it say? That they all ate and were what? Satisfied. Okay, and this isn't just like a momentary satisfaction. There were 12 baskets left over. Like the, the idea of this whole thing is to say, listen, I'm going to provide. You're going to be fully satisfied, and there's more. There's more. Ten thousand, fifteen thousand people. Two loaves. Five loaves, two fish. You see, what Jesus is doing is saying, listen, I have the power to do this. I have the power to, to fulfill and to meet and to allow you to be satisfied. I am healing. I, you know, but not only am I healing, but I have the power over, over food and substance. Like he is meeting everything to show them that this is something unique. To convince and to care. Okay, but not only that. So immediately, I look at verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples. Uh, he made his disciples. Understand that, okay? Jesus told his disciples to do this. To get into the boat and go before me. I think this is a form of care. Okay, they're tired. They're exhausted. They don't want to. Like, it's like when people over at my house and Ashley's done. I'm like, Ashley, go up to bed. I'll take, I'll take care of the rest. You know? Most of it's verses that uh, she kicks me up when I go to bed and she stays and cleans up. It's um, probably a better way to look at it. Immediately, he, he uh, I got his disciples in the boat to go before him to the other side to the, the Bethsaida, which is, again, just kind of the other way, um, while he dismissed the crowd. And after taking leave, he went up to the mountain to pray. Hey, we're praying at 845 on Sunday, next Sunday. Jesus himself needed to pray often to get alone, to pray, to pray with others. Prayer is important. There's nothing more important that you could do for your spiritual life than get together and pray with people. You should be praying regularly. But one great habit has come to all church prayer Sunday morning at 845. Jesus got up and prayed alone. Verse 47, and he went up and came to the, or he, he went, I, I can't read this well. And when the evening came, the boat went out to the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw them making headway painfully. Uh, now, where he was on the mountain, he probably actually could see that. Like the, 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 the Sea of Galilee is small. Like there are areas where you could go, you can look out and, and you know, if you know, like he probably really could sit there and see that. And it says, and he saw them making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And there was about the fourth watch of the night. And he came walking on the sea and he meant to pass them by. I think he's testing them there. I think he's testing them there. He's walking on the sea. Cause that's not normal. All right. Just, you know, we, especially if you've grown up in the church all your life and we hear about this Jesus walking on the sea thing, it becomes kind of normal. Have you ever tried walking on the sea? It doesn't work, okay? It's impossible. It's my Spanish. Martin, you're not even here. Like, we can't do that. We can't walk on the sea. And here's in the middle of the storm, Jesus is just like sauntering across the water. Okay, and the Bible is telling it that way because it's meant to be like, yeah, this is normal for him because he's different. And he saunters across the water, meaning to pass them by. And this is a test. Like in reality, she'd be like, oh, what's up, Jesus? How you doing, man? Yeah, you command us. Remember that part where he commanded them to get in the boat and go? You command us. We know that you're going to get us across safe. Uh, we're not surprised by the fact that you're walking on the sea. But what happened? <laughs> it's a ghost. Sorry, Reese, if you're sleeping, I apologize. It's a ghost. For they were terrified. 
Verse 30, verse 50 says, for they saw him were terrified, but immediately he spoke and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, that word, take heart, it is I, uh, that is the I am statement. When Jesus met Moses in the burning bush, and when God told him to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy land, and Moses walks up and falls on his face, and God says who he says. He says, I am that I am. That is Yahweh. Uh, and it's and the reason that there's no defining statement after is because it's impossible. Jesus, God is never ending. I am that I am. I am all that I say that I am. And you know, you, I say, I am Jesse. I am a father. I'm a pastor. God says, I, I am. I am that I am. And that's that there. This is a God claim. And, um, and he uses that as a comfort. He's getting in the boat using his power as God. Yeah, I'm that God. And he's using it to comfort the disciples. Even after they didn't do a very good job. Even after they shouldn't have been freaking out. And look at what it says. It says, take heart. Do not be afraid. And he got in the boat with him in the wind seas. <laughs> the second time this has happened. Happened a few chapters ago. Again, just crazy. And they were utterly astounded. Look at verse 52. For they did not understand about the loaves and the fish. For their hearts were hardened. So these two things are attached. Okay. They're not fully understanding yet. There's something going on. But at the same time, Jesus is still caring deeply for them. Sorry, guys. Maybe next week my throat won't be quite this uh, parched. But, and he, he is using the fact that he is God. He is trying to comfort and convince them that he is God. In the verse, at the end of chapter 6, look at this, it says, verse 53, when they crossed over, uh, they came to the land of uh, Gennarat, just that, thank you, and moored it to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people to their beds or on their beds uh, to wherever uh, they heard he was. And wherever he came in the villages and the cities or the countryside, they laid the sick on the marketplace and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garments and that they might, and as many touched it, were made well. So this is kind of a summary of all the things that he's doing, but it's also a, just a picture of like wherever Jesus went, he was healing. Like and, and to the point where it wasn't he, like, it was to the point where even his garments were healing people. Even just the touching of his garments, they were like God himself was allowing that power to flow through Jesus to heal people, to care for people. Why? Because he wanted to show, he, wanted, he was using his power to care for people and convince them that this was something different. If someone walked into this, you know, building, this, our, our, our church building right now, and, you know, and we touched it in all of our uh, uh, infirmities, 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 yeah, whatever they are, sicknesses, brokenness, problems, and you were healed because you touched them. We were like, wow, right? Like, that's, that's what I want to be a part of. But here's the thing, okay? <clears throat> Take note of, most of these people don't follow Jesus at this point. Most of these people don't follow Jesus at this point. And if we're honest, we probably wouldn't either. It takes a supernatural work of God. And, um, and if you know God, that it is a supernatural work. God has shown that to you. But God also does all of these things to use his power to care and to convince so that we can go back and look at it and be reminded and encouraged and, and, and like empowered. You know, Jesus was showing that this is not normal. This is something different. I am something different. I'm coming because I care for you. I'm coming because I'm the son of God. And the only hope that you have is through my death and my resurrection. And he wants people to know that he cares for them deeply. He also wants them 
to be transformed by his power. And that happens by believing that he is who he says he is. Um, you know, it's, it's bad to mix medications, right? Okay, I'm glad that they label medications. You know, uh, if, if you have diarrhea, you don't want to take laxatives. Okay, that's just common sense, right? We don't, we're thankful that we can know uh, exactly the, the, the kinds of medications we have to take for different things. But the power of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, it has come to deal with specific things. It has come to help us understand that God loves us and cares for us, to convince us that, that he is worthy to be trusted, but it has also come so that we can be convinced that he is the son of God, so we trust and obey him. And we need to regularly look at the power and authority of Jesus and understand that this is what it's coming to do. The power of Jesus has come so that you remember that Jesus cares deeply for you. And when you look at, okay, well, Jesse, I'm not, I don't, I'm not seeing like Jesus isn't feeding the 5,000 or 10,000 or 12,000 anymore. No, but he has, if you're a follower of Jesus, he has brought you from death to life. He has brought you from the bounds of hell to the bounds of heaven. God has given us the greatest power that we could ever experience through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We experience a far greater miracle than those people on the hills in the desolate places when they ate and were filled because we have a spiritual hunger that, hunger that is eternally filled in Jesus. You know, every time that we see people transformed by the power of the gospel, we are seeing a mighty work done. But we see lives that go from complete brokenness to utter dependence upon Jesus. That's a miracle. You know, there are sufferings that we as believers go through in this life. And when God shows up in the midst of that suffering and gives us strength to endure and sustain and to continue on, that's the power and authority of Jesus caring for our life. The fact that he has given us the revelation that we know that heaven is coming, that his kingdom is going to be for all eternity, and that we can rest on that even in the midst of a difficult life. That's the power of Jesus. The fact that if you're a believer, that you have the Holy Spirit, and you can open up this word and read it and study it, and it, it makes sense to you. And it changes your heart. And there's been so many times when I have opened up the Bible and I've been in a rough place. And by the time I get done, I'm comforted by these words. Even some of the hardest words in here, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of Jesus at work in our life. And we might not always see it like we did when he was walking. But church, we have something that's so much greater. The whole, like the reason that these people didn't immediately become followers of God, even when they saw these things, is because they liked Jesus like a lucky rabbit's foot. We like Jesus because he's our Messiah. And he died in our place and then sent us his spirit to live inside of us. <clears throat> to show us that he cares and convinces us he is the son of God. And so we need to do that. We need to take time to remember he does care for us. You know, sometimes we get bitter at God because we don't take time to see how God cares for us. My kids were a little bit upset this weekend because we didn't have power for a long time. You know, so what we had to do, we sat down, we were like, all right, let's talk about all the things that God has done for us, that we have a generator that someone blessed us with years ago and that we have heat and that we have a fireplace. And, you know, we, and, <clears throat> and it, it takes some time just to go back and, and remember these things and, and if you are angry or frustrated at God or bitter towards God, a lot of times it's because you forgot the ways that God has cared for you. That we need to regularly remember and intentionally apply the gospel. I have seen God care for me. He has used his power in this way, in this way, in this way. He's met me when I was here. He saved me from my sin. He has given me heaven. And that, like, and just, <clears throat> we're seeing God care for other people. But then too, we also need to take and see the, the, the power of God and remember that, or the power that Jesus has and remember that he is the son of God. 
okay this is we go before the power in the throne room of god or we go for the power of jesus we're going into the throne room of god <clears throat> this is not something to do lightly this is something that we should fall on our knees and desire and want in a healthy you know in fearing god in a healthy way and we're not just like he is god jesus is our friend but he's also the king and he has authority over our life and he can make demands on our life because he is God and he has used his power to show us that. And if you're struggling to obey the commands of God, if you are struggling with sin, if you are struggling to obey the things that God has called you to, you need to take time and remember the power that God has used to bring us into his kingdom. He died so that you can have heaven. He died so that you can trust in him and he shows you that he cares for you so that we can trust him as the son of God and king of kings and Lord of lords. And so then we need to trust him when we see God's care for us. And when we see <clears throat> the power of God on display showing us that he is the son of God, our response should be to trust and believe what you say is right and good. Even when I don't like it, even when it's difficult, I know you care for me. I know what you have for me is best. And why do we need to be reminded of that? Well, two is my last point. Because we often live like we've never seen Jesus' power. We often live like we have never seen Jesus' power. Here's the problem. Even after seeing all of these miracles, uh, the disciples don't always act convinced. In fact, there's a lot of times like they're like just anyone else. You know, right after they came back and they had done all of these miracles and they had the power of God given to them. When God told them, you feed the 5,000, there at least should have been some symbols of one they understand that this is a test and that God wants to continue, that Jesus wants to continue to teach the disciples. And there should have been some movement, even if they didn't understand how God would use it, some movement towards the fact that they knew the power of God was standing in front of them in the person of Jesus. But instead they started going back to accounting. Oh, can we do this? And, uh, I mean, like, okay, if we're honest, how often do we have a problem when we immediately start to try to fix it by earthly means? <sighs> so, I guess we're more like the disciples than we thought. That's right, Reese. They were thinking like people who had never been with Jesus and seen his power or using his power. But in the end, yet again, Jesus' math worked out just fine. They all ate and they were satisfied. And here's the thing, Jesus still used the disciples to feed the people, even when they didn't get it, even when they didn't do it right, even when they didn't do what they should have done, Jesus still allowed them to be a part of the miracle. God still allowed them to be used to shepherd his crowds. And then they get in the boat and Jesus commands them. Here's again, okay, this is a command of Jesus. Jesus knew what was going to go on. This wasn't, this wasn't a surprise to him. He's allowing them to go through these times to see, to learn. He's using his opportunities to teach us and to teach them. He sends them back across the lake. And it wasn't going to work out for the way that they thought. They hit another storm and they were making, it was difficult. And, and they were making slow progress. <laughs> and then he's going to walk by them. Could you just imagine that? Him, like, just waving as he's walking on the water in the midst of the storm. I don't know. I don't know what he would have done. But yeah, he was, it says he was going to walk by him. And again, I think that was a test. Like, yes, they were hitting a storm. Yes, they understood, but they under, but they also knew that they were sent by God. God commanded them to go across the water. They've seen God calm a storm before. God would provide for them. God would allow, but instead they were terrified. And when they saw Jesus walking, instead of being like, oh, that's probably Jesus. He's done things like this before. They thought he was a ghost. Like, how often? Okay, again, church, this is just crazy, okay? How often when we see something supernatural, do we start turning and twanning to like, 
Okay, if you're I'm a tangent here, okay? I got a couple minutes, right? You guys ever hear of that like string theory of creation? You guys ever hear about that? Like, like this, how did, it's like we're all like I don't know. It's nuts. I've seen it a few times, but it's like shoot, like the uh, Discovery has done this like string theory, and like it's this like these things that vibrate and they come together and 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 they it's understood to be credible, which is mind boggling to me. And then as you get to the end of it, you realize that it's something that's done by aliens. Okay, I've seen this show, and it was a long time ago, and I've seen it on Discovery. It's come on a few times. It's, you should look up, like, the string theory or something like that. And I think, like, the, but it was sent by aliens. And there are people who think that this is credible. We don't want to believe in a god, but we're going to bring in, we're going to believe in string theories and aliens to bring about creation. Like, so how fast do we go from, like, hey, everything could be explained by a perfect and holy god to, like, we have no idea, but we're going to believe in strings and aliens. But that's exactly what the disciples did. It's a ghost. They had been with Jesus. <laughs> and then Jesus gets in this boat and he immediately comforts them. He uses the I am. But then in the boat, it tells us in verse 52 that they did not understand about the bulbs and the fish and their hearts were hardened. Um, and again, I think you know, I think the disciples were in kind of this, they, they were learning, they were growing, they needed grace just like the rest of us. Um, but, but something I think is important here is to understand you know, a lot of times we feel like if we would have been around and seen all of these miracles and see, seen all of these things that Jesus did, that we would be different, that it'd be easier for us to believe. But it's not. I mean, here they are, here are some of the, and these, these men become some of the greatest men through all of church history, okay? they eventually believe outside of Judas. They eventually believe and, and, and do a mighty work. They start the church. We are descendants of the apostles, okay? Um, and so they're going through this process of learning to believe. Uh, but if you and I were there, we would be just like them. Seeing more miracles, more power, uh, that's not going to make it. It's the hardness of our heart. It's do we depend on Jesus or do we not? Um, and this is a process that we all go through. And we need to realize that we have it. Church, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the power of Jesus. There is nothing greater than you have. And the reason that we have less access to it is not because he's far away. It's because we don't live like it. It's like um, we were at snowblowing. Yes, I bought a, I bought a new used snowblower. My other snowblower is just getting old, and I'm frustrated with it. And so I went and bought a rebuilt errands. Um, it's nice. It worked out really well, but it ran out of gas at one point in time. Okay, so then I just called my boys out. We were it was mostly done anyways, and so we were kind of like you know, cleaning it up. And and I didn't tell them it was out of gas. I just it was just sitting there empty, not doing anything. And one of I'm not going to tell you actually two of my sons. Um, they were all out there, so you can, you know, there's math there. So you don't really know who it is. But we're like, Dad, why are you using them? Why are we out here working? You have this brand new snowblower that can be doing this work. Why are we doing this work and not that snowblower? Well, they didn't know that it was out of gas, you know, but, but they should have, they had a right. Like, Dad, look at that thing. It's beautiful. Why are we doing this work? We want to build character, okay? So there's legitimacy there. But at the same time, church, we have the power of Jesus at hand, and we turn to so many other things. We have the beauty of the gospel to specifically speak to different areas of your life. Every area that you are going through that you are struggling with, anger, fear, comfort, frustration, disappointment, brokenness, the gospel specifically speaks to that area of your life. And it takes time. You can't just be like, whoa, I'm going to get this done in a day. Like the disciples are in the midst of learning this from Jesus. And it takes years. This is, they've been with Jesus over a year. And it takes time for some of these things to sink in. But we have the power of God at our fingertips. But we don't live like it. 
We live like everything else is more important in our life than Jesus. Everything is more important and needs more of our time and energy than the gospel of Jesus Christ, both for you and for others. Your greatest need is to have the gospel specifically work out in the areas of your life where you struggle the most. Depression, anxiety, anger, all of those things. At the same time, your greatest calling is to display the power of God and tell the power of God to a watching world that so desperately needs it. A world that so goes from, hey, I can believe in God, to I'm going to believe in strings and aliens because there's nothing better. What? Do you want to know how we're going to make a difference? By living that we've, like we've seen the power of Jesus on display. There is nothing more important than you spending time with God, meeting God, allowing the gospel to remind you that God cares for you, that Jesus cares for you. He has used his power to care deeply for you and that he is the son of God and he is calling you to the best thing that you can possibly do and then go and live like it. A believer who understands the power of Jesus is unstoppable. And so church, we need to live like it. I want to see our numbers grow. I want to see people saved. I want to see broken marriages come together. I want to see broken people made whole. I want to see our lives grow. I want to see the gospel at work. I want to see disciples built. And that comes from people who are on fire for Jesus. Because we have the power. He came and he showed it to us time and time again. And we've experienced it. And may he cares for us. If you are longing, there's a desire in your soul to be cared for in any way. Don't neglect that. Let that be met. But let it be met in the gospel of Jesus. Let it be met in the most significant place possible. But then go give your life to the kingdom of Jesus because he came in our place. And there is nothing that anyone can do that can take that from you. So this week, I would just encourage you, spend time with the Lord. Spend time remembering the ways that he cares, the way that he convinces. We have to take time and be specific about seeing the ways that God has used his power, the ways that God has used his authority, the way that God has loved us and cared for us, the ways that God has convinced us this isn't just something that you can know and learn at one point in time and then be good. We have to spend time with God. We have to remember. We so easily forget. We need to take time to remember day in and day out. We need to be in God's word. We need to be studying good material. We need to be caring for one another. This is something that we need to give our life to so that we can be convinced again and again and again of the care of God for us. And then two, we got to live like it. You are a follower of Jesus. If you trust in Jesus as your savior, you are a child of God. You have the power of God in you. You have the kingdom of heaven coming. Man, cast your anxieties on him. Trust in him anew. And then share it with somebody this week. Share your faith with somebody this week. Share testimony, whether it's the first time you got saved or whether at the time where you've just seen God at work, share that with somebody this week. Be the power of God on example. And challenge me, I need to do this, man. I have not done this well in a long time. And to kind of get us our hearts and minds ready for those things, we're going to take communion. And the band's going to come back up and we're going to sing a couple songs. And communion is one of the best ways that we can be reminded of this. But we are reminded of Christ's body broken on our behalf. God himself, the King of kings and Lord of lords, died for us. And his body was broken. And if you're a believer, this is for you. And this is a time to remember that, to take time and apply the gospel. And just think of an area uh, right now as you are getting ready to take communion where you need God to come and care for your soul. Maybe you need to, conv- maybe you need to confess a sin. And just take time and ask the Lord to show you sin that you need to confess and confess it and trust that God is going to care for you. Maybe something you need to trust God, but before you go take communion, 
<laughs> Say, God, I know you will care for me. I am going to trust you with this. And then take that bread. And then when you take the blood of the new covenant, it's the grace that Jesus is covering. The King of Kings spilled his blood so that we can experience his grace. And we take that, we remember that we don't have to live by our power. We don't have to live by our abilities. We don't have to live by our own holiness or sanctification. We do all of that by the power of Jesus. And when we take that blood and we drink that cup, we are reminding ourselves that Christ's blood was spilled so that I don't have to live by myself anymore. And that Jesus has it. And be encouraged. Rejoice. Worship. Worship your face off. And then go and be the power of Jesus to the watching world this weekend, man. God, we come before you this morning. And God, we thank you for the gospel of Mark. And we thank you just for the ways that you remind us and the ways that you keep us. And uh, Lord, we are just thankful that... Uh, you have come and you've put your power on display. You've showed us time and again, God, that you care for us deeply. Like ultimately, you've shown us how you care for us by the giving of your son on the death of in the cross and the, God, the resurrection over the grave. God, we think that we can take that perfect life. And God, that's what you see us through. God, I pray that when we do that, we would also understand that we are called then to be obedient to you because you are the son of God. Convince us yet again that you are the son of God and there's nothing more important that we, that we can do than give our life for the sake of that. God, soften our hearts, just like you did to the disciples year over year, day over day. God, allow our hearts to be softened until we fully realize what you've called us to be. God, I pray that we wouldn't be people who forget the power of Jesus, but Lord, that we would be on fire. God, that you'd work through us in miraculous ways. God, that you'd work through our prayers. God, you'd work through our sharing. God, you'd work through our suffering. God, you'd work through our blessing. For your glory and your kingdom. Take communion. Let us remember afresh the words that you have done for us. In Jesus' name.